and, 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 and Jade is the founder of this group, I've just been told. Yeah. yeah. Where's the so, microphone for tonight? Oh, oh, right here? Right here. Um, I can move closer. Is that like omnidirectional? Or yeah. Should I go stand by? No, it's, it's, it's fine. And if it turns out that anyone has trouble picking you up, I'll move it for you. All right. Good talk. I'm here to make your talk easier. So I'll move whatever needs to be moved. All right. This is like a first class situation. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. All right, well, hello everyone in the room and on Zoom. Um, my name is Jade Allen. Um, I've been an Erlang developer since 2010, um, which is quite a while. And um, recently, I have to admit to you, I've become a DevOps person, um, sort of not on purpose. It just it's like one of those things that just happens to you. If you get care mad about something and then they're like, you're the DevOps person. So that's what happened to me. Like. We were deploying a lot of Erlang software and we had like almost no process around packaging it and like putting it out for distribution. And so I got super like care mad about that. And then so suddenly I backed into this job of being a DevOps person. So for the last few like year, 18 months, whatever, I've been doing mostly DevOps stuff, but honestly like Erlang is still in my heart and I just wanna share some Erlang love with you guys. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about Erlang timer wheels. Um, timer wheels themselves are not like a new idea. They've been around since the 80s. Um, in fact, like the paper, I hope that some of you at least glanced at or skimmed or read the summary <laughs> of was written in 1987. Um, it's a, still an amazing paper. Honestly, it's very short. It's easy to understand. It's incredibly powerful. But what a good technique it is. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Um, also, at any time, if there's questions that you want to know about Erlang or time channels or whatever, just ask. It's fine. Like, I'm not like one of those presenters that like if you get in my flow, like you know, I'm gonna be totally oh. flustered by it. Oops, 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 oops. Yeah. Um, are you on the Zoom meeting or no? Because so. yeah. if you don't mind jumping on the Zoom meeting, that way you can share your slides with everyone um, okay. on Zoom. Sure, I can do that. If you go to the website, uh -huh. you get up on yeah. Uh, okay. First, I have to get on the improving Wi Fi. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Our uh, improving students yeah. and improving. Well, you know, I guess we're going to have a slight technical difficulty. And I'm not even using Linux on my desktop, so you guys are super lucky today. You know, we're not going to have like 15 unplug, replugs, kernel panics, so like all just, that kind of thing. Just, just a quick warning: you don't want to say that too loudly because the folks are going to be next to us are Linux group people, and this is a Linux person. This, this so we are, everyone knows yeah. that Linux for presentations <laughs> is so trash. <laughs> That's only on art. I, I, I've never had a problem. That's not no, even debate talking. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. All right, I'm just going to throw some bombs out and you, we can discuss it after I'm done talking. Oh, we're gonna or, have or, you know, if you really get mad at me, you can just grab some of and throw it at me. <laughs> okay, like my computer does not like improving oh, are we Are we having an issue with that? I don't know. Maybe my computer is trash. I, I should be. I have an alternative. Okay. Our, our capital I, I, oh, no. the, yeah. <laughs> That's so probably why it's not working. It needs to work on that. Uh, oh, true. Look, look, it's doing oh, something. Here we go. It's yeah, doing the thing. Oh my God. Okay, here we go. Woo! Okay. Woo awesome. Oh, that's the best. <laughs> okay, um, now I need to go to the thing and do the thing. Yes, go to the thing and do the thing. It's all about precision. Yes, I, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right, uh, so this is the thing here I need to join. So, yeah, she's connected to right Zoom meeting and then she will show your screen and I'll see it here for also. What are you trying to do, Jerry? This one, this makes me want to understand the video game netcode. Yeah. Wait, are you looking at the Erlang timer? This is the, yeah, this is the, this is the paper. I want to join. Oh, we'll the paper myself. You know, you know, want to join the email and audio. Okay. Okay. Oh, hey, there's me. 
Okay. Okay. See something good. That You're not sharing. Yes. That's good. Um, I just want to check. Do remote participants have the shared screen? You should see the uh, the title slide. And feel free to speak up. I, mean, I yes, see it. We see it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, do this like that. Okay, that will work. Okay. Uh, okay. So, is it still the thing? Mm -hmm. We're good. Did yeah. it change now? You're good. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, first of all, let's talk about how weird time is. Um, who thinks that time is weird? Who has right. never programmed date time math? Who has never been super frustrated with date time math? Anyone? Never, 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 never. Everyone in this room knows that it's one never, of the. Never, everyone in this room never, knows never. that date time math is one of the three armpits of computing. The other two armpits of computing are printers and serial cables. Okay, those are your three armpits of computing: date time math, printers, serial cables. You'll notice that two of them are possibly related to one another. Okay, but programming those things are awful. Um, and the reason one, one of the reasons they're awful is because time is very political. Like it's this abstract thing that humans have invented. And so humans have interpreted time and time, like how they want to do time for their place in different ways. So, you know, in our country, there really wasn't a notion of time until like the middle of the 1850s when railroads started like having time, like train schedules, right? And then people were upset that they didn't have local noons. So they decided, well, we're going to have time zones because of geography. And then, you know, that was the start of some really terrible ideas. Um, but the problem is, is that time itself, everyone thinks it's like this sort of always progressing, fully, like strictly monotonic, advancing counter. But the reality is that actual time is not like that. It's quite a bit messier. Um, so I have a couple of factor crafts. Uh, who here thinks that it's a fact that time always advances? Fact or crap? Just say fact or crap. Well, correct. Context. Are we like? Are we talking about like an Earth like near a black hole? Because I'm willing to. You know what? I love that you brought up black holes. <laughs> but let's talk about not singularity time. Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about Earth time. You know, without like giant gravitational fields to influence how time goes. <laughs> I think fact. Yeah, right? Like intuitively, we think that's a fact, but in fact, it's crap. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> okay, gonna, explain to give an example where time does not amount to fact. I'm going to do that. I promise I will do well, that. So, most, most, the most practical programming scenarios for us, it's always one of the years. There are cases like before before the Julian calendar, before the zero Julian day, where my calendar. Uh, that's, a, that's a reference to a calendar. I mean, sure, that's that is a specific problem. Actually, like before, you know, before ranges that are sort of outside of our normal like computing timeline, those are definitely annoying. Um, but like that's not what I'm talking about in this situation. Um, so I have another factor crap, which is NTP is a thing. Who knows, who knows what NTP is? Okay, I mean, what someone blurred out what is NTP? It's, 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 a centralized time. It's a centralized time protocol, right? It synchronizes clocks on computers, right? Right? So why do we need to synchronize clocks? Like, why is that important? Security. Security is a good reason. Why else? General relativity. General relativity. <laughs> We're not doing computing like on the edge of stuff. Like the Disney movie from the 80s, Black Hole, not applicable. Here. Because we are not. I mean, like with the for doing GPS or something. Like yeah, that. for GPS, yeah, right for positioning, right? Because like the pendulum in the, in the grandfather clock like slows down, and so it keeps worse time. So to and then I'm in a very OCD, and so if his clock isn't exactly <laughs> right, and like that that might be good just to do it because always there's some type of error that might happen. So yep. maybe just having at least a specific thing to be synchronized. Is good, but it's right. right. not the solve problem because I really need that. Synchronization sounds very stable. Synchronization is super stable. <laughs> yeah. So, in one of my next slides, we're going to talk about how we why clocks are important for distributed systems. But for right now, we're just talking about time itself as an abstraction. 
Okay, so who here has heard of a, of a leap second? Yeah, so what's a leap second? Uh, you're supposed to go and keep the old voltage, like to keep commuted the one year on old is 365.25 days. So we have leap years to compensate for that. Correct. But even though, even the fact of a leap year does not compensate for the rotation of the old, like That's because of few seconds. That's, That's also second. correct. So every year, every single year, there is a leap second. Okay, the leap second generally happens on January 1st. Does anyone know how computers process leap seconds? How do you process a leap second? So you it's just sync to NTP? It. <laughs> yeah, it's magic. Like, it's literally magic, okay? Like, the fairies come out of the wall and they tag your computer and then the leap second is magically passed. Okay, so there's all kinds of different ways that companies have decided to approach this problem. Leap seconds are generally processed by your clock not advancing for one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. That is why time always advances. It does not advance when leap second. That's correct. Okay. So that's a case where it does not. Now, there's also been buggy, buggy implementations of clocks and computers. Who's surprised by that? No one. <laughs> no one is surprised by that. In fact, there are documented cases where NTP has rolled back the time on servers that are supposed to not have that happen, and shit breaks like that. It happens instantaneously because it's unexpected. Okay, so if there's one rule about distributed systems, it is that you must expect the unexpected, right? The old classic saw is you be liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you send, right? That's like the rule about building distributed systems. Okay, so we talked about like how weird time is, how political time is, um, how like time itself doesn't always advance because of like these needing to match with actual hashtag science um, and like all kinds of things like that. Okay, so that's specifically about time. And then the next thing I wanted to talk about is distributed systems. So I'm a distributed system nerd. Like that's also close to my heart. You can probably guess that because Erlang is a wonderful language for building distributed systems in. Um, so let's talk about some of the reasons why we need reliable clocks. We've already mentioned a few of them. One of them is positioning, right? We need to be able to calculate like where we are uh, based on triangulation, triangulation, count on time, so we need to have really accurate clocks so that we get a good um, measurement of where we're at on the Earth, right? We have a, this big satellite like cloud, and it's sending a signal, and we're timing that, and that's how we're going to figure out where we are on the Earth. So that's important. I didn't put it on here, but that's a great use case. Um, another is coordination of state replication, which we touched on uh, just a little bit ago. There's this idea um, in sort of uh, distributed system transactions that um, there are like these different isolation levels, which means, you know, if I have multiple writers, like what is the ordering of those writes? Like how are we going to record that in our, in our sort of source of truth? Um, and sort of the highest level, the highest guarantee of that is this thing called linearization. And linearization is essentially this very intuitive notion that over some time T line, that the writes are going to be ordered, right, in the correct sequence. So, you know, if you have two writes that happen simultaneously, you have to resolve that somehow, but at the end of the day, there's gonna be the, this total ordering of all the writes at a certain time for a certain register, right? Okay, so that's linearization. Um, you need to have good timing for that because, again, you need to collect like what time these things happened at and then resolve them if there's a conflict. Um, there's also retries, like failure recovery, right? So you have an algorithm, it didn't work, or you have a remote partner that's not responsive to you, you need to detect that somehow. That's called failure detection. And then we also have retries, which I touched on already. Um, and then finally, like there's algorithms that do traffic shaping, traffic control, right? So you have back pressure in your distributed system, or you're sending out data and you don't want to overwhelm something. And so you send it out like a little bit at a time and you save the rest and send a little bit more and you send a little bit more until your bucket's empty, right? So that's another case where you need a timer and a callback and something needs to happen on this sort of interval set, um, schedule, right? Okay, so um, let's talk about how we can implement some timers, right? So the paper that, uh, that I asked you all to read or that I want to talk about tonight discusses a couple of ways that the authors are aware of to implement timers. The first one is direct access. What does that mean? It's literally, we're gonna pick a piece of memory, we're gonna put a counter in that thing, 
and we're going to decrement it. We're going to just keep decrementing every tick of the, of the hardware clock. We're going to go to that memory location, decrement it, and when it gets to zero, we're going to do something. Whatever that something is, we're going to call a routine, whatever happens, happens, right? Um, so that's a very um, elementary way of implementing a timer. <clears throat> Straightforward, easy to understand. The problem is, is that what happens when you get to very large numbers of timers, right? Um, there's a really big scale problem here, which is there's a lot of overhead, bookkeeping, um, on every single tick, you need to access every single timer um, and decrement it. And obviously, as the number of timers increases, that's going to slow down your computation quite a lot. Um, so that's not a good method. Um, the second method is sort of like the first method, but instead of just having like a single memory location, we're going to put a list of things, possibly ordered, possibly unordered. In the paper, the authors discuss like the various trade-offs with doing that, right? So then there... Um, that's also problematic because as that list gets very long and then you have to keep evaluating the things at the front of that list or at the rear of that list, depending on which method you've picked and what trade-offs you've chosen. Um, another method that's in the paper that's not on the slide is that there's this idea that you're going to have a tree. So instead of having just a straight up array, you're going to have a tree, right? And then you can do all kinds of tree stuff and that drops, you know, the complexity to n log n which is better than n, um, but still not great for large n's, right? Um, and then method three, which I love as a distributed system person, is you're just going to ignore wall clock time. We're just going to completely forget about wall clock, and we're just going to worry about processing events as they occur, right? So as an event comes in, we're going to look at it, we're going to classify it, we're going to say, oh, this is an event x, this is an event y, we're supposed to do this when we get x, we're supposed to do this when we get y, and then you can just count those. Like, I've gotten 10 x's, Right, so now I'm going to do something with all 10 of those. Like, I'm going to roll them up, I'm going to summarize them, I'm going to retransmit them, whatever the thing is that you're supposed to do with them. Right, um, that's like a perfectly legitimate algorithm to use in a distributed system. Um, but in this particular case, we are talking about wall clock time. And generally, you still have to deal with wall clock time, even if you're sort of ignoring it. Because, um, and for debugging purposes, you want to know when those events happen, right? So. If your system is processing events and you're like, you know, I just got 10 X's, what am I going to do with them? Um, you're going to want to say, well, this X came in at time zero, time one, time two, all this sort of thing. Because later on, when it fails, you're going to be like, what was I doing when it failed? Like, what event was I processing? If they don't have to wall clock time, it's going to be really hard for you to figure out, <laughs> look at a log file or whatever, um, and try to figure all that out. Okay, so. At the end of the day, like you can't escape from wall clock time, even if you're ignoring it. Um, and um, you know what's wrong with that implementation? Nothing. But you still have to deal with wall clock time, so we might as well deal with it. All right. We can do better, right? What if I told you we could do better? That's the point here. So the way that the paper talks about doing better. Here's the paper. Um, this paper is called Hashed and Hierarchical Timing Wheels, Data Structures for Efficient Implementation of a Timer Facility, right? It was written in 1987. It's by these guys at DEC. Um, really great paper. Highly recommend it. But here's a timer wheel, right? So this is the idea that's in the paper, sort of distilled down to a diagram, okay? So in the middle of the diagram, um, we have this uh, timer wheel, right? It has all these slots in it. We made this really small little timer wheel. This is an 8-bit timer wheel. So every time the clock ticks, we're going to just look at the timer wheel, um, the slot that it's in, and we're going to see if there's any little boxes there. Those little boxes are timers, okay? And depending on your implementation, they may be ordered lists or un unordered lists, um, but we're going to evaluate the head of that list. And if the head of that list is expired, then we're going to process it. In fact, we're going to process every element in that list, okay? Um, we're going to see it like where it if any of the jobs in that list expired every single clock tick. Um, and that way we can compress the number of memory locations that we're storing data in, and we can also do much more fast evals. We don't have to evaluate every single timer, every single clock tick, right? Um, and we can also like schedule these things in advance. So that makes it nice. There's some other algorithmic things that go on in the paper. There's the idea of hashing, right? So um, that means that like, let's say we have, you know, um, this eight this eight bit timer wheel here. So we're, every time we put a new job in, we're going to take the time that it expires and do modulo eight, right? So that's going to tell us what bucket 
the little the little box goes into, right? So when we're building this linked list off the timer wheel, we're going to look at that. We're going to we're going to hash it, right? Do a um, consistent hashing is what it's called. We're going to do that, and we're going to put a little box in that list, and then every time that um, spot and the wheel comes around, we're going to check all the jobs in that list, right? And then as the jobs expire, we're going to remove them from the list and you know, do whatever it says to do. Hopefully asynchronously. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's the basic idea for a time wheel. Is, is everyone clear on that? Like, does that make sense to everyone? Is there any questions about that? No questions up there. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> I did tell them to speak up if they had any questions or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're on Zoom, check the chat. Uh, yeah, go to the chat. If you're screen. on Zoom, um, then you have a question, just pop it in the chat and yeah. someone else. So, so wait, yeah. uh, so this is a simple plot, right? And this plot always increments like once, like every tick or whatever. So this plot technically had like eight different, eight different, eight different things in it, right? Yeah. So this. Uh, so from two to three, then three to four, then four to five, to six, to seven, to seven. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's like, how you're using this. Well, so let's pretend that you know, we have this like really simple timer, and you know it starts at zero. So every time that thing increments, we're going to do modulo eight, right? We're going to take whatever time time tick it is. We're going to do modulo eight. That's going to tell us a number on this wheel from zero to seven, and then we're going to get a location, and we're going to evaluate all the little boxes in that list, right? Okay. That's the basic timer. Yeah. But but each time we pass one, we're only going to do one event. No, no, we're going to expire anything that's expired. Oh, okay. so even iterate on that list if we need to. Yeah. So the idea here is, depending on if you sort the list or don't sort the list, the paper talks about both both oh. techniques. Um, you know, sort of if you sort the list, then you can actually have an evaluate time uh, that's approaching. O of one. Um, it's actually O of n, but in practice it's O of one because generally speaking, your expires are at the front of the list or at the back of the list, depending on how you implement it. Um, so you don't have to do that many you know, evaluations, right? You don't need to evaluate the entire length of the list. Um, if it's unordered, you get really fast insertions, but then you have to look at more potential metadata, right? To decide should I do something with this or not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So, um, so let's talk about Erlang now. So Erlang has been around for a super long time. Uh, the first version of Erlang was released in 1986. Um, timer facilities were added, like, I think, you know, around release five, something like that. So not, not out, out of the gate, but pretty quickly after that. Uh, about six years ago, the developers, the core team for Erlang decided they were going to completely overhaul the time system in Erlang. So Erlang has this primitive called now, which is a function. Um, that function returns this terrible time couple. Um, it has this concept called megaseconds. Megaseconds are the number of seconds since the unique epoch times 1 million. So yeah, so you take that first number, multiply it by a million, and then you add the second number, seconds, to it, and then you get epoch time. And then if you want the millisecond resolution, you can add that on the end of it. Um, so you have to do like this crazy math operation to figure out like what the system time is. And the other property that now as a function has is that it provides a strictly monotonic increasing counter. Okay, so it's super useful for generating reference IDs, unique identifiers. So as stuff comes in off the wire and you want to give it a name or a tag or distinguish it somehow, you call now and it will give you what is guaranteed to be uniquely monotonic advancing timer. Even if the actual wall clock time is not monotonic, you will get a monotonic value from now. Okay, but this is a problem because to generate that monotonic time value, Erlang has to coordinate with all the other nodes that it's talking to. So if you, um, in Erlang, it's really easy to network a set of nodes together and they can do all sorts of fancy stuff like fail over between run times and do all kinds of inner node communication for free. Like you get out of the box, it's really neat, but you also have to coordinate a lot of stuff. One of the things you have to coordinate when you call now is, okay, what does the other node have for time, right? And has it already allocated a tag, right? Because it has to be unique across the entire cluster. So it requires a lot of communication and coordination to generate that value. Um, you can see in a very busy system when you're calling now a lot, it's going to be a big problem. You're really going to have a bottleneck in that call. 
Um, also, there's this weird tuple, right? You've got to deal with that somehow. So um, it's not great. Like the user interface is really not good. This is expensive coordination. People really wanted to get system time, and this is the way they were doing it. Um, but it's not cheap, right? It's not just asking the operating system for a time value. It's like talk to every single other node, go out, get this value, generate it, give us it back, and then we'll figure out what to do with it. Okay. So that's terrible. We need to do better. So after OTP 18, they basically overhauled all the stuff. So they made it more um, discreet. Like you could pick to do monotonic time, if that's really what you want to have. Um, there's also a new system called, called System Time which is literally like, give me the system time. Um, there's also another call called OS timestamp, which is the same value, but less interpretation. Um, and then the other thing that Erlang does, which is kind of cool, is we talked about how NTP is a little bit weird. Um, so, you know, when you have NTP across a fleet of servers, you're gonna have like one weird server that's like off in La La Land. It's gonna be like 30 seconds late, a minute late, like two minutes late, whatever. It's just the black sheep of your fleet. All the rest of them are keeping good time or like reasonable time, but this one is like off in La La Land. No one knows what, what the problem with it is. Um, you know, maybe it's a bad crystal, maybe it's a bad board, like whatever it is, doesn't matter. Um, so the, the question is, when NTP hits that server and updates the clock, and then the clock is suddenly like either 30 seconds faster or 30 seconds slower, how does Erlang account for that, right? So it's been going on its merry way, writing timestamps, using the system clock, probably. Um, how should we deal with the skew, right? Um, before 18, there was only one way to do that. But after 18, there's like four different algorithms they came up with. And the default one is the one where it sort of gradually either increments or decrements the internal clock so that it gets to be aligned with the external time that's coming from the operating system. But it doesn't happen like, like in a snap, okay? It takes time. It takes whatever the adjustment period is. Usually it's like four hours. So over a period of four hours, it will slowly increment or decrement the internal clock so that it will match with your system time, which is pretty cool. There's all kinds of other like strategies that has super configurable. It's actually quite, um, it's like almost too configurable. Um, Sorry, can I, can I, it's slowing the clock yeah. or it's going backwards? Um, it's slowing the clock and letting Enough. this, System time, sync. yeah, so, sync okay. up gradually, right? It's going back. I, I suppose you could put it like that, but that's not how I think about it. It's basically advancing more slowly. <laughs> no, no, that, that was my that was my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because okay. going backwards causes all types of problems. If, if it's out of sync the other way, does it slow down? Yes. Oh. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's what we're doing. Oh well, I, oh I thought. Oh, you mean if, it, if the system it times is, ahead of where yeah. it is, it will in, it will increase increase oh. it slowly over the interval, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, so that it will catch up. Eventually, there will be synchronization between the runtime and the OS layer, right? Because in early the the, um, the runtime is different; it's discrete from the OS layer, even though they have pretty similar functions in a lot of respects. So that's really how Erlang deals with like wall clock time at um, kind of, you know, an operating system or, um, and also a runtime system level. I want to talk a little bit about Erlang's timer facility now. So Erlang has a built-in timer facility for, um, you know, programmers to use in their code. Um, and here's like one of the interfaces that it offers. Uh, this function call is called apply after. Um, and if you look at the paper, um, you'll see that there's a couple of interfaces that are defined in the paper. The thing that I found interesting about Erlang's implementation is that this function call is very similar to the function call that's in the paper. In fact, it's almost identical. Um, the only thing that's really different here is you know, kind of the specifics about how Erlang does uh, function calls. But essentially what it does is it, return, it takes a time, and that time is um, either an absolute time, like if you're doing monotonic time, it will take an absolute monotonic time, or you can be relative time. So you could say like 10 seconds from now or 5,000 milliseconds from now, um, execute this function, right? Um, and in this case, it's a module, a function name, and a list of arguments. Like those are the, the that's what all the types are underneath here. Um, and then what it does is it returns to you a tuple that says, okay, if it's successful, and then it gives you a T-ref. A T-ref is a time for reference, a reference um, in the Erlang runtime is guaranteed to be unique on a specific node. 
Um, and so that way it's a good distinguisher, right? So every single node will generate its own unique references and they're unique across the entire cluster. Um, even if you have, you know, 10 early nodes talking to one another, every single time you generate a reference, it will be unique. Um, that's one of the guarantees of the runtime. And it does not require coordination, which is lovely. So anyway, um, it's this opaque term, essentially, that gives you a unique distinguisher. Um, and then reason is a term. A term in Erlang terms is could be literally anything. In practice, it's an atom. If you don't know what an atom is, it's essentially a tag. It's, you know, if you're familiar with Ruby or whatever, Ruby has this concept of tag, right, where it's like colon and some keyword. Um, that's the same thing in Erlang. It's just called an atom. So um, hopefully that helps people understand the erlang Um And then there's another function I want to talk about, which is send after. Um, so this is apply after, which is after a certain number of time, apply this function. This one is send after, which is after a certain amount of time, send this message to this destination. Okay, so in Erlang, everything is processed, right? When you do computation, it's a process. And so you need a way to send messages to two different processes. And maybe um, you need to do that on a schedule, right? We've already talked about all the reasons you might want to do that. And since Erlang is really, really suited for building distributed systems, it is a very common practice to send a message to another process after a certain amount of time. Um, and so this is the way to do that, um, which is really interesting here. Um, now, th there's a little message that you'll see down here. This says send after three. It says see also timer module section in the efficiency guide. You're like, okay, uh, what is the Erlang timer efficiency guide say about timers? Um, well, this is what it says. It says that creating timers using Erlang send after and Erlang start timer is more efficient than using the timers in the interfaces I just talked to you about. Why is that? It's because the timer module, which I just showed you guys, has this overhead, has all this bookkeeping that needs to do when you create timers through it. So if you create a lot of timers, it will slow down your processing because it has to do all this internal bookkeeping. We just talked about why that's a bad idea. I don't know why the implementation for Erlang has that, but it has these primitives, okay, Erlang send after and Erlang start timer that are written in C, or actually they're written in C++, um, and so they are super fast. Um, and whereas the Erlang code, the timer code, is not written in C++, it's written in interpreted language, actually compiled language on top of C++ runtime, so it's not as efficient, right? Plus it has to do all this overhead of bookkeeping, blah, blah, blah. So basically the net net here is that when you're sending time, or when you're sending messages or processing time in Erlang, these are the primitives that you should prefer. Um, if you do a small number of timers, using timer is not bad. Um, but this is sort of good Erlang style. Use the Erlang module ins instead of the timer module. Okay. So why does the timer module exist in all that? Historical reasons, number one. But number two, there's other functions in the timer module that are super useful. A couple of them are for um, tracking it, like execution time. So like there's a function in there called TC, which takes a time um, and will calculate how long it takes to execute a function. And it will return the milliseconds, how long it took to execute, and also like the result from the execution, right? So I ran this function, it took this long, here's the result. That's what it gives it back. That is super useful, does not use the entire um, process, so it has no bookkeeping, um, and so there's like no penalty for doing it. Um, so that's a reason. Another reason is for doing math with time. So like, for example, you want to con um, convert an hour into milliseconds, you can do that with this. If you want to have like uh, the number of milliseconds in five minutes, which is another thing that happens all the time, right? After five minutes, send this message or give up, like we're going to fail, um, right? Note the failure, all that sort of stuff. And you don't want to actually like do the math, figure out how long five minutes in milliseconds is. You can say, you know, timer minutes five, and it will return the number of milliseconds for you. Um, so there's some good reasons to have it around, but for using it for actual timers, not a good idea, which is very ironic, but it's something about Erlang that, you know, people should know. Um, all right, so uh, let's go back to my little diagram again. Um, I know you all have seen this before. So I, what I want to show you now are, is some of the source code for doing Erlang timer wheels. Oh, like this is the actual C++ implementation that they've chosen. Um, and I just thought it would be interesting to talk about. 
Um, so I just want to make sure like everyone has this in their head as you kind of go through this, this code. Um, so Erlang has this idea that has two timer wheels. Um, one of the basic questions you might have is, well, how big is Erlang's timer wheel? Well, that depends on how much memory you decide to let Erlang have. Um, but in the general case, it gets 14 bits. So it has this idea of a soon timer wheel and a later timer wheel. And there's also an immediate. Uh, so one of the things you can do is you can use a timer, but you can say after zero, which means do this right now, right? So it's kind of this weird thing, but that also actually goes into the timer wheel. It just gets executed immediately um, by the scheduler, right? So Erlang has its own scheduler, um, and it you know will dispatch that job to a to a processor immediately, right? So it'll get computed right away. Um, but the soon wheel and the later wheel both get the same values. Um, if you're doing debug, it's ten, right? Because it's small, it's easy to track. If it's like small memory, you get twelve. Um, and then the default one is 14. You can see the scene wheel, the 14 bits is 16 seconds, right? From, from now until 16 seconds ahead. And then the later wheel is 36 hours from now. So 37 hours, whatever it is, 37 hours, 16 minutes. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as we go through the next piece of code here. Um, and then this is the actual structure for the Erlang tire wheel. Um, I know it's a little bit of an eye chart, um, but the thing that I thought was really interesting um, that you might want to see is that you can see at the top, there's the at one slot, which I mentioned. Then there's the scene wheel, and then there's the later wheel. So they're all kind of smushed together, actually, in Erlang's implementation, um, which is pretty fascinating. Um, so I think that's really cool. Um, and then one of the other things that I really wanted to call out here is that um, there's like a lot of sort of interesting bookkeeping down here at the bottom where it talks about like the sort of next timeout time, like are there empty buckets between now and when the next time I'm gonna look at this thing is? Like, can I just skip over them? Do I even need to look at them? Um, and so it can keep track of stuff like that. It just like, I don't even need to evaluate my timer wheel until I get to that time, right? So I can just kind of ignore it. Um, and then there's some monotonic things here, right? So internally in the Erlang runtime, it keeps monotonic time. So the monotonic time comes from where? Where does it come from? Anyone have a guess? The wall clock? Yeah, it comes from a wall clock, but what wall clock? Oh, oh. It comes from the computer's wall clock, right? It comes from the computer's wall clock. So, so in the Linux kernel specifically, I don't know about other systems, but in the Linux kernel specifically, there's a system call that's called get monotonic time raw. Okay, and um, I think that it's hilarious. There's like all these interfaces to get monotonic time in the Linux kernel because many of them have had bugs in them. <laughs> in fact, there's some serious WTS um, that I'm going to show you like in a couple slides uh, where monotonic time has actually gone backwards because of bugs in the kernel. So <laughs> when you're writing a system like Erlang or a runtime like Erlang or Java or something else, you kind of have to deal with all these weird WTS that you get like because of the implementation of the operating system, right? They're not like bugs in your code, they're bugs in someone else's code. Um, and I know we've all worked around that in our lives uh, as developers. So I just think it's interesting and kind of funny that, you know, uh, you know, it's even down deep in the guts of, uh, you know, very complex runtime things to like all this code to basically deal with like bizarreness in the operating system. All right, good. so, so I, I wanna see if I'm understanding correctly. So. The wheel is advancing according to the amount of memory that you've allocated. Well, so the wheel size itself. So let's go back to this. The wheel size is based on those bits, right? So that's how big this wheel is going to be. Okay, how many bits? It yeah, stops. how many little based blocks? On correct. So, okay. yeah. Okay. So as the time comes in, it's going to be 14 bits, like whatever number that is. It's a power of two. So it's yeah. two to the 14. Like that's some you know, pretty big number that I don't know off the top of my head. Um, we're going to hash it. We're going to get a bucket location. And then we're going to see if there's something there for us to do, right? Okay. Uh, and then in that data structure I just showed you guys, um, we're going to keep track of which buckets are full. Like, if there's an empty one, we'll ju we're just going to skip it. Like, we're not even going to look at it. We'll just, we'll just, next time we evaluate this thing, we'll see, is this thing having whatever, right? We're not even going to go check our timelines because there's nothing there to look at. Um, so 
there's all kinds of like little shortcuts and, and sort of implementation hacks that they've added here to really improve efficiency in how they're computing these things. All right, so I promised you one of the WTS. Um, here's one. This is a kernel problem. Um, so uh, this came straight from the, the system call that calls get monotonic time. Um, depending on what the Linux kernel is, you can actually be negative, um, <laughs> which is obviously not that great. Um, <laughs> so there's one WTF that I kind of thought was funny. Um, and then here's another one, which I like. Um, so this, what this does is it returns the maximum like drift of monotonic time. So even monotonic time itself in the operating system can drift, right? So it itself is not necessarily strictly monotonic, right? It can either repeat in values um, or it can, you know, advance like more than one, right? So, um, which is still monotone, but like, it's like not intuitive, right? It's not intuitive. That's how a clock should behave. Um, so like, even though you're asking for monotonic time, you may not actually get strictly monotonic time, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, all right, and then um, like, that's all I have for you tonight. Um, I mean, I hope you enjoyed the paper. I love this paper. It's like one of my favorite papers. Um, I think the implementation in the Erlang uh, runtime system is really cool. I think Erlang is a really cool runtime. Um, you know, I'm happy to talk this stuff, any Erlang stuff. It's like, you know, um, make provocative statements, like, you know, whatever. So anyway, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, uh, no questions. There, there, was a com there was a comment uh, uh, from Proctor, uh, backwards compatibility is something that the Erlang slash Beam developers keep in well, mind too. Maybe Proctor can unmute himself and ask the question. Well, it was more of a comment. Okay, well, but if you want, if you want, if you want, if you want to mute and kind of uh, um, yeah. So the, someone asked why timer was still around, and I was just that comment was that the Beam developers don't like removing things from from things and breaking older releases, so they try and keep it. And I'm sure Jade can speak to that more. They try and keep it. As parity, if if you're running on 18 or you're running on 17, they try and keep as much working on 26 as possible. That's so right. it's not like, hey, this thing's broken, don't use it anymore. We're gonna leave that in there for old code to run and still keep running. So in general, that is super true. Um, it is not necessarily strictly true though, uh, because some of the things they took away are um, super annoying. Um, but better, I mean, they're better. They're honestly better, but like dealing that transition point was very annoying as a programmer. So, but yes, in general, Erlang developers, the core team, whatever, they're super sensitive to removing functionality that's present in the runtime that has been there for a long time, even if it's bad, like objectively bad. Um, Cause they have clients and users. Like one of the ways that Ericsson makes money on Erlang is they develop custom distributions of it for clients. And then those clients build code on top of it, and they have like certain expectations that this code is going to live in Erlang like literally forever. And that expectation is generally met every single release. Um, I mean, there's stuff in there that I have no idea what it's for, but it's been in there. Like, there's still a Corva object broker that's in there from like you know the 2000s when Corva was like super hot and you know the big next thing or whatever. So it has that in it. Like, who uses that anymore? I don't know, not me, but like, I'm sure someone out there in the world is. <laughs> so, but yeah, thanks. That's a good, a good point. Other questions online or in person? So, so I, I um, I'm trying to think of how to ask this question. So you talked about how much you like this implementation, but I'm still unclear as to why. And, and I guess I'm, I'm going to say this as someone who knows that time is perplexing and has fought with it, but doesn't necessarily, I'm not necessarily able to recognize like a good versus a bad in, implementation unless there's a comment saying, okay, well, let's you know, watch out this let's, backwards. Let's think about a time scheduler that people find somewhat unreliable, like the Windows event system. Uh, just to pick one random example, um, 
I think, you know, it's gotten a lot better, but, you know, there was a time when it was very unreliable in terms of executing things that you wanted to be done. Um, right, so I feel like that's an example of a timer that is not reliable and you can't have a lot of confidence in. One of the reasons I like the Erlang system is that it is very granular. You can do up to a millisecond time and it's almost dead on accurate every single time. Like Erlang was developed to be sort of this soft real time system. And so one of the things that they've worked really hard to do is to make sure that the timing system inside of it is very responsive. Um, and as I mentioned before, like when you build distributed systems, especially things that process in near real time, then you want your time system to be very accurate and reliable and dependable. And Erlang has been like very bulletproof for a long time. So like one of the benefits of using an older runtime system like Java, like Erlang, is that it's been through all these battles, right? Like they bring, they wrung all the bugs out of it. And I find that to be very attractive in a programming environment. So. Mm -hmm. Lots of British questions. No questions, questions here, huh? I mean, I mean, usually have some. I mean, I mean no, the, only, the only thing I was gonna say is just a comment. I hate time. <laughs> but that's, you know. Well, as I said, it is it is one of the armpits of computing. So yeah, I mean, I mean any time in general now, just all time computing. Oh, okay. Well, I think you know we should just give up this concept of local names. We should just all be on Z time, and just, <laughs> that's fine. Just get used to it and get over it. I mean, it might make sense to do that, especially if you have space travel. You don't want to have care about like Mars yeah. time or Jupiter time or whatever. Just, have a specific time thing and then that's it. So yeah, that's true. Okay, so this is a random aside. There is a there's a con there's an academic conference that's called Planet Wide Distributed Systems. And that is one of the things they talk about is like how do you deal with clock skew when you have like light seconds or light minutes of like transmission distance between you and a spacecraft or you and a robot or something like that. Um, right? How do you replicate state across that kind of distance or barrier? Um, and it's pretty fascinating, like the ways that they have tried to address those problems. So, so if so, you really want to get your nerd on, read like, the papers from that conflict like the Byzantine like, laser or something. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that's like one of the things that, that they want to do is start using lasers for transmission instead of radio. Lasers are, lasers are more, more, not more fast, but they are consistently approaching the speed of light, whereas radio signals sometimes slow down. That's a dispersing us, right? It's more coherent, so we should more like Depends on the laser, but yes. The most enlightening thing about this is just, it's not my fault. Another excuse to pull out another When uh, uh, my pen shows up out of order. That's right. right. Tell your boss. It's not my fault. Time is all right. There's a black hole. Yeah. Time, there time, you go. Is, time is garbage, and I don't know how this works. <laughs> so, so um, obviously, Erlang. This is a primary concern for Erlang. Yeah. Right. Fundamental. How difficult is it to implement this in other languages? Well, other so languages? over so what, time, what, what are the requirements? Yeah. So basically, the requirements are you need a hash table. Yeah. Right, like it could be super simple. I mean, it's literally you need, seems like, yeah. yeah, you need a hash table with a certain amount of buckets in them, and then you order. You have a linked list that hangs off of it, or a tree, depending on implementation. That's an implementation detail. Like, how many timer jobs are you going to have? Generally, it's cheaper to just have a list, and it can even be unordered if there's not a lot of timers. Um, and you can decide what a lot means, right? Like, you can make that dynamic even. Um, but yeah, I mean. Right, so it's very, very straightforward algorithm. Um, you have this wheel it has a certain number of slots. You have the timers that hang off of each one of those buckets, um, and you can even have them hierarchical. Right, so let's say that you have a wheel for. In the paper, they talk about using a bucket for days, a bucket for hours, a bucket for seconds, and then every time you go around the wheel, you advance the top bucket right by one. So, for example, if you had a wheel that had sixty slots for seconds and 60 slots for a minute, and, and 24 slots for an hour, and then whatever, 365 slots for a year, then every time you do the second wheel, 
you advance the minute wheel by one, right? And so on and so on and so on. So that's a, another way you can kind of like do even more like storage efficiently and higher hierarchically um, at low cost, like low lookup cost, low implementation cost. It sounds like a use case for my business. <laughs> Like I mean, are we super deep? Are we are we gonna like veer into Haskell land now? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think about it. So. No, it's good stuff. That's good stuff. So, um, I think I have a question. Yeah, I haven't read the paper, and I do not understand what that diagram means. What are those uh, divisions in the donut in the middle? They're basically just little slots. So they're just distinguished distinguished locations. And what we're doing is we're taking the current time and we're basically slicing it up into these different regions, right? So you think about like a timer. So we're going to have something that expires at time 10. We're going to figure out where to put that job on this wheel by taking the time when it expires, hashing it in this wheel, and then sticking it in the right bucket, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. And how and when does the the current pointer advance? It depends on the implementation, but the simplest one is that it just advances like a clock. So every single clock tick, you just slide it around to a new position, and then you look at the little green boxes and you say, "Okay, I'm in I'm in bucket three. Is there anything in bucket three that expires at time now?" And if there is, you execute that whatever that is, like you send a message, you execute a function, whatever it might be, right? Right. Is that, that's third really on the work or, or system or, or system work? The, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Is that, is that a relation to the work or CPU work to this? Yeah, thing? it's generally keyed off of the system time, generally, but in Erlang, it has its own the Erlang runtime keeps its own clock separate from the system clock what? because it powers the wheel using its own internal timer. So, um, okay. Yeah, that's the big advantage of Erlang here. Okay. It's the, so, so does it get the ticks from the system? Yeah, I mean, the, the underlying ticks come from usually a hardware source, right? Like there's literally a crystal on, a, on the motherboard, okay. right? That's sending hardware interrupts and said, I've done a thousand Hertz. Here's your tick, right? Right. So that does come from the operating system, but Erlang itself does all the bookkeeping to keep that like strictly monotone. So even though like the underlying operating system is bullshit and the hardware clock itself might be terrible and NTP is out there being a little chaos monkey, the Erlang runtime is going to keep trying to do what it does in a way that's predictable. What gives the operating system uh, Schedules Erlang in a bigger way. Well, so that's something that Erlang can't control. Right. Right. Uh, there's no way to predict how the, how that interaction is going to happen. But hopefully, the Erlang uh, runtime will get scheduled adequately, and it will be able to do its processing adequately. Okay. But yeah, no guarantees, right? Like, there's right. no guarantees for any of this. Like, there's no silver bullet. I mean, yeah. But there's failure everywhere. It's like failure all the way down. <laughs> yeah. You know, especially in distributed <laughs> system. It's turtles on the on the back. turtles all the way down. I mean, that's like my favorite thing to say, but it's literally true. But they're upside down on their shell. They're, like, they're yeah. all very sad turtles. Yeah. 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 Sad turtles all the right. way down. <laughs> well, you can. It's super short. I mean, yeah. it's like six pages. I, I feel like it's my fault for not reminding people to read the paper. Well, I don't know. Very that's easy. right. It's all because of cloth. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of that space conference? <laughs> it's called it's called planetary scale distributed system. Oh, thank you. We have a just off topic here, also from Proctor. I love uh, off topic. Wants to know if you're still doing your barbecue field trips, and if so, when is your next Dallas Fort Worth visit? <laughs> um, I mean, uh, Proctor, I hate to tell you this, but I'm basically pescatarian these days. Um, I am almost vegan, actually, so uh, 
I'm vegan except for brisket, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't make a lot of barbecue road trips anymore. Brisket okay. Sorry, that's not vegan. That's not really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. look, I live in Texas. I've got a, you know, a vibe. Also, brisket is just freaking amazing, so. So, so um, we're going to talk more about that in a minute, um, but I'm going to suggest that we're going to stop the recording really soon. So if there are any other things that you want to get onto the recording, questions or comments onto the recording, do it now. Otherwise, going once. we're going to say thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll continue the Q&A and discussion. Yes. And there'll be more like, there'll be offline shit posting, which you're going to miss. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do I stop recording now? Yep, stop recording. Thanks, Angel. <laughs> All right. All right. It, it'll set. There's a format that comes online. Oh, it's like it says we're pretty stuck. Yeah. yeah. Mrs. Zoom, stop Mrs. recording. Zoom. <laughs> sure stop recording. To